didn't these youngsters do an incredible skit? How amazing. Can we give them another big hand? That was absolutely phenomenal. And yes, today is Good Friday. This is the most important date on the Christian calendar as we remember the solemn procession that we just actually witnessed where the Lord of the universe, Jesus Christ, the Savior, the sacrificial lamb, was beaten, he was stripped naked, a crown of thorns thrust upon his head, eventually nailed to the cross, and on that cross he cried out, Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And just before he breathed out his last breath, he said, it is done. It is done. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said that it is done? Why did he have to go and die on that cross? Now, last week we started our, our three-week Easter sermon series that we've entitled The Christ, The Cross, The Cost. The Christ, The Cross, and The Cost. And what we've been looking at is we've been preaching through the Gospel of Mark, but it's fallen perfectly for us for a great Easter service and an Easter sermon series. And last week, we started off and we looked at the Christ, that the disciples for the very first time in the Gospel of Mark acknowledged that Jesus is in fact the Christ, the Anointed One, the Lord. And yes, they had seen Jesus heal people. They had seen Jesus cast demons out of people. They had seen amazing things. But this is the middle point of the Gospel of Mark. And what you find is a market change in tone as Jesus journeys towards the cross in Jerusalem. But for the very first time, Jesus is going to share what his mission is to his disciples. What was the reason that he came? What was the reason that he had to die upon the cross? So let's stand together as we read the word of the Lord from Mark chapter 8. We're going to be reading from verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days to rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for what you did for us 2,000 years ago. Lord, we are even thankful for what you do for us even this day. Lord, I pray that we will never, ever become familiar with the cross of Christ, the necessity of your death on that cross to set us free. Open our hearts this morning as we hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can take your seats. I'm going to start off with a story this morning. Now, many of you know that I've had a second vocal surgery on my vocal cords. It was a 10-year process of dealing with a paralyzed vocal cord, a partially paralyzed vocal cord. And before we could do the surgical interventions, we had to do a whole battery of tests. And the one test that the guy had to do was to test if there was actually you know, nerves supplying the vocal cords. And so I went to the doctor's office. There was this other guy there with him. And he said, okay, you're going to lie down. Just lie down nicely here on my, on my table. You're going to tilt your head back. That's okay, beautiful. Okay, so he said very calmly, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put this needle through your throat into your vocal cords. Sorry, what? Now, I'm not a guy for needles. How many of you are people for needles? How many of you enjoy a needle? Now, on a good day, I'm not a guy for a needle. But when your doctor instigates a conversation with, I'm going to put this needle through your throat into your vocal cord, let me tell you, it catches your attention, does it not? And so eventually it comes to the moment of truth. I'm lying there, and the needle goes in. And before it goes in, he says, you need to lie really really still. 
I've never lay so still in my entire life. I handed myself over to glory. Dead still, it goes in and eventually now it's into the vocal cord and he says to me now, this is the worst part of the whole thing. He says to me, okay, now what I want you to do is go, it sounded like I was in a Frankenstein movie. And eventually after all the tests, everything is done, he takes it out and I could say that we've now finally done the test. Now, let's be honest, why on earth would you put yourself through such an ordeal? Why would you put yourself into the hands of a doctor lying there for him to do exactly that? What was going through my mind? And I think it's three things that come to mind for me. Firstly, I need to believe that he's in fact qualified, that he knows what he's doing, that this man has studied, he studied the human body. I need to believe that he is in fact qualified to do this horrendous deed that he did to me. Second thing, that he is in fact able to diagnose that which is wrong and have an answer for it. That he can give a diagnosis and that he can give uh, uh, some kind of surgical intervention to make it better. And then lastly, I need to believe that the intention of the doctor is in fact to bring healing. These are some of the things that help you through that moment where you go through such an ordeal. Now, when we look at the disciples and the text that we've just read, here we find the ultimate physician. He is the ultimate doctor who wants to bring healing to people in a way that the disciples didn't just catch yet. And he starts to share with them his mission, the operation that he has been sent to accomplish, which is now to die on the cross. He shares this information with his disciples and they reject it out of hand. That's their response. Why would they reject it? Why would they come to a place where they've just said, Jesus, and remember last week we found out, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one. They've come to that conclusion, but immediately after that, Jesus says, I'm going to go and die on the cross, and they say, no, you're not. You cannot do that. Now quickly, let's look at the scripture a little bit clearer. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now I can only imagine what was going through the minds of the disciples while he's busy sharing this information with him. I mean, he is open and emphatic. He says, not only is it a suggestion that I'm going to suffer, I must suffer. I must go through this ordeal. And they're thinking to themselves, what? You mean to tell me that the Messiah is going to come and suffer relational, physical, emotional, and spiritual harm? I thought the Messiah was going to take all our enemies and he's going to make them suffer and we're going to be his inner circle. And we're going to have political power. We're going to be the guys in charge. That's what we had in mind. We don't want this suffering savior nonsense. This is not what we desire. Or how about when he says, I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be rejected by the chief priests. I'm going to be rejected by the Pharisees. Now, what that word rejected in the Greek it means that a person is not only just rejected for rejection's sake, it means that they failed to pass scrutiny. That he's going to stand before the Pharisees and the chief priests and he is going to fail to pass their scrutiny. Wait, hang on a second. How embarrassing that the Messiah is going to stand before men and he's not going to pass the holiness test. That's not the type of savior that we want to serve. A suffering savior rejected by people, that's not what we had in mind. And then he says, and then I'm going to be killed. No, wait a minute. The Messiah is supposed to come and he is going to dominate everybody else. We're going to be your henchmen. Now you say that you're going to be killed. Who wants to follow a Messiah that's going to be killed? 
and then he's going to be raised after three days. Is that even possible? Why go through that entire ordeal and then don't need to be raised from the dead? Why is that even needed? Is it possible? You, it sounds like the musings of a madman. Why on earth should we follow this guy? And very often in the Gospel of Mark, we see that Jesus speaks in veiled terms to his disciples that they don't always fully grasp or understand something. He speaks in parables. But it says here, for the first time, he spoke to them plainly. He spoke to them in a direct tone to say, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to die. I'm going to be rejected. I am going to suffer. This is going to happen. And at this stage, Peter's had enough. And he takes Jesus aside, and it says that he rebukes him. In fact, that word rebuke, is the same Greek word that they use when they rebuke the demons out of the people. What a harsh way to speak to the one that you just acknowledged is the Christ. Now what follows can only be described as one of the most spectacular falls from grace in history. Just a few lines earlier, Jesus tells Peter what a legend he is or the fact that he came up with this glorious revelation that Jesus is in fact the Lord, the Christ, the anointed one. And straight after that, he says, get thee behind me, Satan. Now let's watch this, verse 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now obviously, Peter isn't Satan. But both Peter and the disciples have placed their desires on earthly power. They have these earthly, human, selfish desires for what they think the Messiah should be. And they miss the point completely. They miss the point completely. In in fact, what we see is that they are trying to tempt Jesus away from the mission that it's been called to do. They are literally in cahoots with the devil trying to get Jesus not to fulfill his ultimate mission. But Jesus turns to them and he says, get behind me, Satan. This is something that I need to do. This is the very mission that I've been called to accomplish. I must suffer. I must die. This is what needs to happen. Now, why did the disciples miss it? I think that's probably a good question. Why did they get it so wrong? Why didn't they fully understand the need for suffering and what a big deal the suffering of Christ and the passion of Christ truly was? And you know what? I think it relates both to you and to me even 2,000 years later. I think on a surface level, the very first thing is they don't appreciate that if Jesus is the sovereign Lord, then surely he is the one that directs our paths and what his will is needs to be done. Even though they think, no, Jesus, you cannot do that. No, Lord. How many of you know when you say no, Lord, then he's not Lord? Then he's not. And so they fail to appreciate that he is in fact Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person in the Godhead, in the Trinity. And if he says that the disciples need to follow a suffering Savior, even though they don't understand, surely they need to say, yes, Lord, we're going to follow you. We don't understand it yet, but we're going to follow you. How many of you need to realize sometimes we need to follow Jesus like that when we don't understand, when we don't get it? Why? Because he is sovereign. In fact, Jesus becomes such a beautiful um, example of this in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before he's handed over to the authorities and he is basically now on the way to the cross. He prays and he says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass over me that I don't have to go to the cross, understanding the suffering that's about to take place. But then he follows it up and he says, but if it be your will, I will submit to that. If it be your will, 
I will follow that. And he becomes the perfect example of how we as human beings need to follow the will of God in all things because he's sovereign and he is the only one qualified because he's the creator God. He knows what is best for you and me. But I think there's a greater reason why they misunderstood it. And this is probably the key as to why they're not trusting in Jesus' will. And I think this is what really relates to you and me as well. The disciples didn't understand the necessity for the cross. They didn't fully grasp why Jesus had to die. They didn't appreciate why the lamb must be killed. They didn't appreciate the diagnosis of their disease. Now, what is the diagnosis of their disease, which is the same diagnosis of our disease? They fail to recognize how holy he is and how sinful they were. And this contrast between his holiness and their sinfulness creates a divide between God and human beings. A divide that all of us, every single human being, in some way or form, starts to feel, starts to realize there is something wrong with the world and my place in it, and I cannot quite put my finger on it. And then the great question that we have, what happens to me when I die? Have I done enough to attain paradise? Have I not done enough? What happens to me when I die? How can I experience a closeness? How can I experience purpose? And why is it that I'm running towards something that's going to fulfill me, but nothing else fulfills? Now that, what I'm describing now, is the great divide between us and God, meaning that we cannot be fulfilled by anything here on this planet So we grope around for something that might fill us. And all of that is because of our sin. And that is the very reason why Jesus went on this mission. That is the very reason why Christ came to die. Because the good news of the gospel, and I know many of you might know the good news of the gospel, but it's something that we can never become familiar with because it is glorious, amen? What is the good news of the gospel? that God became man through Jesus Christ to walk among us in human form. And he lived this perfect life with no sin. Watch this, meaning that he was the only one qualified to deal with the problem of sin that we have. I know I've shared this before, but, you know, if you're in jail, only someone that is not in jail can bail you out of jail. And because every single human being has sinned, except for one, Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, only He was able to bail us out of the bondage of sin. And so He goes to the cross as a sacrifice to go in our stead. And then on the third day, He was raised from the dead, proving that He is in fact God. Remember, that's what we're going to be looking at on Sunday fact that the resurrected Christ proved that he is God and now he comes to each and every one of us and he says okay because of what I've done I have now dealt with this issue of being separated from God I've dealt with the sinfulness of humankind and for those who accept me as Lord and Savior who are prepared to repent of their ways and receive me as the Lord They are given the right to be called children of God. They receive forgiveness of their sins and they receive eternal life. And all of this because of the suffering Messiah and what he went through. The disciples desired a Messiah that was going to give them earthly wealth, earthly status, earthly power. But what the suffering Savior gave them was something so much more, an eternal gift of forgiveness of sin, to be back in relationship with the living God, to live a fulfilling, purpose-filled life, and one day we will meet him again when we die. Isn't that a glorious message this morning? That is a glorious message. But there's one more thing that they missed. Not only 
Is Jesus the only one qualified because he's the sovereign Lord of the universe? Not only is he the only one that can deal with the issue of our sin, the diagnosis of our disease, but what the disciples missed was the intention of his heart to go to that cross. And that was the gracious love and mercy that he feels for you and me. This wasn't just done because this was the mission. The mission was you. The desperate love and passion that Christ has for each one of you meant that he was prepared to give it all up so that you and I can receive glory. Isn't that a gracious God that we serve? What they couldn't see was that the cross was meant for their redemption and driven by the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ himself. And here's the question for all of us here this morning. What about you today? Do you believe that God is the great physician and that his son was the only one that could deal with the diagnosis of your sin and your sinful nature and your separation from God? Do you believe that you need to hand over control to this great physician and say, Lord, I'm going to allow you to do what you need to do in my life, even though sometimes it might be uncomfortable because I know it leads to glory and forgiveness and healing of the human soul so that I can once again walk with you in relationship. I hope and trust that all of us can receive this. Do you appreciate his passionate love for you today? Do you appreciate that today? And maybe this morning, the day has come for you to accept Christ, even for the first time. For those of you that have never accepted Jesus Christ, maybe you've come to Easter services before, you've come to church services before, but you've never come to that place where you've said, I am human, He is Lord. I am sinful, He is holy. Lord, come, have your way. I hand my life over to you. I receive your Son to wash me clean. If that's you today, I want you to, to come and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. But then for the rest of us, as we think about the gospel, I know that you've probably heard this message, those of you who've been church going for a long time, you've heard this message many times, and I've preached it many, many times, but let's be clear, it never gets old. It is the cornerstone of our faith. It's the cornerstone of our eternity, and it all revolves around one person, Jesus Christ the Lord, the Messiah. He is the one that came for us. So let's stand together. I want you to spend a moment with the Lord. And while you spend this moment with the Lord, why don't you renew once again your faith in Him, your love for Him. If there is sin that separates you from God, bring that sin to Him because the cross is there for your sins today. For those of you caught in a grip of shame of what you have done, even as a believer, the Lord is here today to say, I'm here to wash away even your shame because what I did on the cross is enough. Because remember, the last words that he spoke on that cross was, it is done. Every sin, every shame washed away. Why don't you spend just a moment with the Lord and say, Lord, I want to renew my commitment to you, the living God. Just spend that moment. Let's spend that moment with the Lord. While all eyes are closed, I'm not going to ask you to come to the front, but if there are people here today that has never accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, I want, just want you to pop up your hand because I want to pray with you guys as well. Is there anybody here who needs to receive Christ for the first time today?
just going to give a moment. Praise God. Praise the Lord. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to be taking communion. But before we take communion, let's be honest. Isn't communion a great response to this message that we've just heard? To once again, as we take the, the, the bread and the cup, to remember his body and his blood broken for us. But before we do that, what we're going to do as a church is we're going to declare the Apostles' Creed together. A statement of faith of what we believe so that even before we come to the communion table, we declare exactly what it is that we hold true. You'll notice it speaks about the Catholic Church. Remember, the word Catholic means universal church. Okay, so um, just so that you understand that. But why don't we do this together? You can follow with me on the PowerPoint. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living, and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. So worthy, so great is your name that these